Your Excellencies, distinguished members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset I wish to thank uh, the young uh, professionals uh, who have constituted themselves as Sri Lanka Inc. and uh, very enthusiastically came forward to adopt uh, a project that a couple of us uh, old uh, hands uh, in the international arena had been talking about. We wanted some kind of seminar, public seminar. Uh, and I'd been talking to our friend Tamara, Kununagam, Palita, Chris, uh, and uh, the young ones. Uh, and this had been swelling around when uh, this very interesting group of youngsters, young postgraduates and uh, corporate sector uh, professionals approached me uh, for discussion on the UN. And in the course of the discussion, I said, we have this thing in mind, and they were very happy to uh, adopt and host it. So uh, I wish them luck in uh, their future activities. Um, I myself am a kind of a sympathetic elder and non-member of Ethel Inc. I fully endorse what they're trying to do. And I must thank them for what they have achieved uh, today. Ladies and gentlemen, there are uh, three basic points that I wish to make in the minutes allotted to me. One that the political stability of post-war Sri Lanka and of the present government will depend to a very great extent on whether or not the 2015 Geneva Resolution, which the government so ill-advisedly co-sponsored, is sought to be fully implemented. If the government chooses to try to fully implement the Geneva Resolution on the ground here in Sri Lanka, I believe that the political stability that we require for foreign investment, reconciliation and a stable peace will be seriously jeopardized. The crisis will be exacerbated and we may enter a renewed cycle of political conflict. That's my first point. And that point is of such uh, importance that I'm going to say it in Sinhalese as well. But don't worry, this speech is not going to be bilingual throughout. Aparate paschat yudha kala pariche de ekena anagate deshapalna stavaratve menma vartamana anduet deshapalna stavaratve boho durata randi pavatne andue samharun visin ounge ekangatve sahitava Atsan Karapu me Geneva Yojana Valia Lankave Polo Thale Paripurna Kriatmaka Karanata Utsa Darnoa the Nadda Yanamata Geneva Yojana Valia Merate Kriatmaka Karanata Meandu Utsa Daru Wot Rate Deshapal and Stavarate Saha Andu Deshapal and Stavarate Darunu Arbudekata Lakana Bhava Deshapana Vidyagnya Kwasang Magye Stira Sara Mate. That's the first point. That it would be counterproductive for the government to seek to implement the Geneva Resolution of 2015. It must find a way to renegotiate the resolution or 
the voters of Sri Lanka will eventually have to come up with an administration that will roll back the resolution. This resolution <laughs> cannot be implemented domestically without very serious consequence. That's the first point. The second point is my dissenting view on what the resolution is all about, what the end game is, what the target is, and who is trying to achieve what through this resolution. And the third and final point is the danger of not implementation, of non-implementation. It, it's not a simple matter. It's not as if we can say, look, uh, let's not, let's just not implement this. This is a serious battle because there are consequences of non-implementation and we have to understand that this is a tripwire. We have to understand what the trap is. Now, let me start with the third first. What's the trap here? The... Uh, Distinguished members of the armed forces who are here uh, will be amused to hear a layperson say this, but uh, the analogy would be a good ambush, where you mine the two sides of the road when you attack a convoy of the enemy. The point being that the members of the convoy die for cover, but they dive for cover into the ditches nearby, to the right and left, which are themselves mined. So, the trap that we are getting into here is that we are damned if we do, we are damned if we don't. If we implement the resolution, we cause our national interest and our state grave harm, and I shall talk about it presently. But if we do not implement the resolution, what happens is, that the High Commissioner's report gets activated. So, it's not the resolution. What they've done is, they have a deadly report of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights with recommendations. The resolution starts and ends with the High Commissioner's report. It commends the report, it welcomes it, it promises to implement it, and it winds up saying, that we shall report to the Council on the implementation of the High Commissioner's report. Now, if you don't implement the resolution, you trigger, not automatically, but through other agencies, the recommendations of the High Commissioner's report. And one of those recommendations, recommendation 38, if my fading memory serves me right, calls on all 193 member states of the United Nations to use the doctrine of universal jurisdiction, the recommendation is explicit, to file cases in their countries against those who are supposed to have credible allegations against them. Credible allegations. So, that's the trap that we have got ourselves into. So it's, it's a minefield. These are claimers. We have to not only handle the, obvious, the landmine, but also the claimers. And that is the challenge that this government faces if it chooses to accept it, or that any future administration will face. Uh, but I must say that given my own experience, uh, in Geneva and also in Paris at UNESCO, which is another organization of the UN where you have votes and very serious battles, I think it can be done. I think it can be done. So it's up to the government. Do we do it this the easy way or do we do it the hard way? Now, ladies and gentlemen, Sri Lanka has, it seems, a certain cyclical pattern. You have the cyclical pattern in warfare, you have the cyclical pattern in the international cricket, which seems to be the two things that we spend most of our time doing. 
And this pattern consists of four phases, the cycle. One, you prepare, you rectify your errors, and you get to the point where you have a significant battlefield victory which can change the course of the entire contest. I can name two such in the case of the shooting war, uh, Varamarachi, in which uh, at that time Brigadier, uh, Colonel Gotabe Rajapaks also fought and several others who are in the audience, uh, 1987, and uh, uh, Rivirasa, where we liberated Jaffa. So you have two breakthroughs, phase one. Phase two, we fail to or are unable, or are unable to consolidate and extend those breakthroughs. Sometimes because of external factors, externalities, sometimes not. And then you get into a phase, a long phase of attrition, where you have one step forward, two steps back. The third phase is one of appeasement. And if you read uh, Major General Kamal Gunaratna's book, you will see that for any fighting man, the period of appeasement hurts more than the period in which you lose lives. Because it's not just your pride, you are conceding very vital real estate. So we have the third phase. And the fourth phase is one of recovery resistance and victory. I believe we are going through the same set of four phases, the cycle, in our external relations. Uh, I regard our ability to secure a near two-thirds majority in Geneva in May 2009 in the face of a U.S. attempt to lead from behind, as they say. And this we know now from the WikiLeaks, which has a long cable from Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, dated May 4th, 2009, and also her email dump, which has now been public, which gives us the details of a meeting also on the 4th of May, 2009. We know that the resolution was driven by the United States um, and fronted by the EU. But our ability to defeat that preemptively uh, to me is the equivalent of 87 and N95 in the military sphere. Uh, we went through a similar phase of unwillingness or inability to consolidate that victory. Then we went through a period of attrition where we lost three resolutions. And now we have the period of appeasement and unilateral retreat. And I'm sure that it will be followed someday by the generation of uh, national will to renegotiate or roll back this resolution. But this is the phase we are in of appeasement, the third phase. Now, what was this resolution all about? There's a paradox here. There are several paradoxes. The paradoxes show us a glimpse of the reality. When I uh, took over in Geneva in early 2007, there was already a draft resolution on the table from 2006. My predecessor, Ambassador Sarla Fernando, a veteran diplomat, handed it to me, as it were, in the pile. Uh, Minister Mahinder Samar Singha, who was handling Geneva as human rights minister, told me, Dan, look, we have to get that off the table. Now, why would there be a EU resolution, a draft resolution on Sri Lanka in 2006 when the war had barely begun? Where were the civilian casualties? Where were the 40,000? The fact that there was a draft resolution in 2006 tells us that it was not about the 40,000. There were no 40,000. It wasn't about the last phase of the war. Otherwise, there couldn't have been a draft in 2006. We got that pushed off. I mean, we told them, look, either you bring it or you remove it, and they had to remove it. Now, 
The other paradox is that uh, for a government that is quite blatantly pro-Western, pro-US-UK, the pressure hasn't been lifted. That's the paradox. What does that tell us? Take Egypt. There are no resolutions brought by the United States about the uh, regime of al-Sisi in Egypt. I'm not saying there should be, but there aren't. Take Thailand after the coup. No resolutions. So if the resolutions were merely a pressure tactic to bring us into line for geopolitical reasons, then logically, now that there is a pro-Western government in place, the pressure should be lifting. The government should have been able to make it go away. Now, I take Chris's point that there was a possibility, but it was not explored by the government. But I'm not really sure that that is entirely the case. Chris quite rightly mentioned uh, the visit by Nisha Biswal and Tom Malinowski, the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Labor and Human Rights. Now, Tom Malinowski made an interesting gesture for visiting diplomat. He went to Mullivaikal, knelt in the sand, and laid a wreath. Now, this is under the friendly administration of 2015. So, if it were merely a question of geopolitics and competition with China and getting us back into line, now they have a government which is, uh, well, it's gone back to China economically, but strategically, ideologically, diplomatically, politically uh, aligned with the West. Why get on your knees in Mulevaika? What's going on there? That tells me that while geopolitics is an aspect, a dimension of this, it's not the whole story and may not even be the heart of the story. Why is it that there's pressure still on? Is it that the government is vacillating? Will this pressure help a pro-Western government, electorally or politically? I don't think so. This is not making the government more popular. Foreign Minister Samaravira uh, seems to be uh, the, the main in agency or engine of driving the two prongs of the implementation of the Geneva Resolution. Um, one is on accountability and so-called transitional justice, and the other is on the Constitution. Uh, three days ago, speaking at the, the residence of our consul, I mean, not a private meeting, a, a, a meeting of the Sri Lankan community in California, um, he was asked questions by a young journalist, uh, Sri Lankan journalist, Hasina Leela Ratna, and um, also a very distinguished lady, Roma de Souza, the daughter of Stanley de Souza, Mr. S.W.R.D. Banaraka's finance minister. And he refused to give a commitment to maintain the unitary form of constitution, and he went on to say that federalism is not separation. Uh, the foreign minister is also on the record saying that the next step uh, uh, this year would be the appointment of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but early next year it would be what he calls the judicial mechanism. And the resolution talks about, as you know, uh, a special prosecutor's office that's outside the Attorney General's office, uh, new laws, and a special court. Now, that cannot make this government popular. Then why is the pressure still on? Why hasn't the U.S. been able to make it all go away? Because there's something else here, another agenda, which has to do with that gesture of kneeling at Mullivaika. Look at what's in the resolution. You will find many of the same things in the efforts of the West concerning Sri Lanka from the late 1990s. These are the things, and some of you may remember, that Lakshman Khadargama resisted. 
You cast your mind back to the Berghoff Foundation and its emphasis on security sector reform. You have the same phrase, security sector reform, in the resolution. There's a remarkable consistency in the agenda of the UK and US. And I advisedly say UK and US because in my experience, the driving force has been the UK. And the US went along. And now it's on board fully. But it's an Atlanticist effort. A remarkable consistency, irrespective of the character of the government. Today, it's a pro Western government, it's the same agenda as when Mahindra Rajapaksa was president, it was the same agenda when Chandrika was the president, it was the same agenda when Ranil Vikramasinghe was the prime minister. So what's the target? What's the real agenda? Geopolitics, perhaps, yes, but in a different sense. There's a, a well-known French intellectual who at least one member of the audience will recognize, Dominique Moissy, a very well-known French uh, strategic intellectual who participated in one of our own efforts uh, when I served as ambassador in France. He has written a very interesting book called The Geopolitics of Emotion. The Geopolitics of Emotion. When the West looks at the world, it's not just geopolitics in a strategic sense. There are certain communities, certain nations, certain parts of the world that they somehow view as unreliable or hostile or inimical. It doesn't matter whether they, were, whether they are communist or anti-communist, it doesn't matter. I mean, Russia today is not ruled by the Communist Party. The Communist Party is an opposition party. But there is hostility to Russia. There is uh, a disguised hostility to China. This has nothing to do with religion, I must say. Nobody must think that this is to do with, uh, you know, Buddhism and the Christian conspiracy and whatever. I know there are some single ultranationalists who think in those terms. I have to remind them that Christian Serbia, which supported the West during World War II, the, uh, which support, sustained the partisan movements that helped Western Yemen was bombed by NATO. So it's not religious, it's not cultural. It's just that some countries, some nations are not seen as reliable allies. It, 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 they don't, the Serbs were among them. The Russians are, the Syrians. Uh, the Sinhalese. That's the story. It doesn't matter what the government is. There is a sense that these are not reliable, even if the government is an ally of the West. There is an attempt to change the deep structure of the Sri Lankan state. That is the attempt to federalize. That is the attempt to effect what's known as security sector reform. One of the targets is the Sri Lankan army. And it is not by mistake that I say the Sri Lankan army, because there is a sense in the West that, well, the other arms of the Sri Lankan military can be co-opted and may be useful. But the army is seen as the most patriotic of the services. This may not be, this may be unfair by the other services. But there is a sense that, well, we can integrate the others into our larger design. But this army has to be atomized. It has to be broken down. That's what it's about. We are the enemy. And over time, it's not just us. As I said, the Serbs were a classic example. There is a kind of sedimentation of opinion over the decades, from 1958 maybe, maybe partly our fault. But there is a sedimentation where in Western society there's a bipartisan consensus. And this is a mistake that the previous administration made because it thought that this was only to do with liberal administrations, you know. 
the Democrats or the Obama White House or uh, the Labour Party in Britain, but if the Conservatives come, it'll be different. It's not. It's a bipartisan consensus because it is to do with Western society. And in those societies, certain communities are seen as bad, certain ones are seen as closer to them. And let's not take this personally. As I said, what happened to former Yugoslavia is a very good example. The demonizing of the Serbs. And now we are told by the International Criminal Tribunal on Yugoslavia that, hey, Milosevic was in fact innocent, but the guy is dead now. But it turns out that this monster, this demon, is now innocent. It doesn't matter because they got rid of him and they got rid of that, that country. So that is to do with the geopolitics of emotion. I am now stretching Dominic Moasi's concept to a notion of the world order, of norms, global norms that the West tries to set in which the West decides when you stop a war. Yes, they did help us, but they did not want the end game to take place. And that we know from the WikiLeaks and, and other documents now. They did not want the military elimination of the Tigers. Not because they were pro-Tiger, but as you can see from the May 4th cable and the May 4th discussion on the emails, there was a sense that, yes, but... You know, the tigers were there because there were genuine grievances and you have to give something. So, you know, we have to try to stop, stop this. Or now that they didn't listen to us and went ahead, we have to make an example and punish them for having gone ahead when we told them to stop. So, certain terrorist movements, such as those in Syria, which decapitate even children and video them, they're okay. If you bomb them, that's terrible. But certain others, well, they are horrible movements and the government should do something about it. So I have five minutes left and I will just draw your attention to what's happening in the world today. Colombia signed a peace agreement. The war there started in 1964. That guerrilla movement which had engaged in quite a bit of terrorism, uh, narco-trafficking, hostage-taking, finally... Uh, signed a peace agreement thanks to the good officers of Cuba. Uh, and, and, and a lot of terrible things that happened on both sides. But the peace agreement is a very good agreement. It talks about transitional justice, but the transitional justice is not one of punishment. It's one of uh, truth and reconciliation, of amnesty, of non-jail terms, perhaps of restricted residence, community service for those who are found guilty on both sides. And that is after a movement agreed to a peaceful settlement. But this movement, the Tigers, refused to, and the military prevailed over them. And we are now going to subject ourselves to a judicial process, a punitive judicial process, which is far worse than anything that the Colombians have contemplated. And Colombia is voting on a referendum on this relatively, on this benign and very mild peace agreement. But we are not being consulted on possible special courts and foreign judges um, in, in going into so-called war crimes. The Last point I want to make is a moral one, an ethical one. We have a distinguished French friend in the audience, uh, Jean-Pierre Page, who's a new author of a brand new book, a well-known progressive uh, intellectual. Now, the reason I mention him is this, because my experience in France and my early acquaintance uh, through my library, my parents' library, tells me that behavior during the fight against Nazism, Nazi fascism, whether you resisted or not, which side you won, was the defining factor in intellectual and social life in France for decades after that, for decades. Now, when I was a student in the university, 
There was a book that we all read called The Penguin Reader's Guide to Fascism. It was by a professor called Professor Walter Lacker. The same Professor Walter Lacker wrote many books, and one of the books he wrote in 1999 was called The New Terrorism. And in that, he said about the tigers that in terms of the sheer ruthlessness of the tigers, the only parallels, and I, I must say in parenthesis that Walter Lacker also wrote a huge book called Guerrilla, which some of you must have read in your military academy, it's like this size. So he knows about guerrilla movements. And he says that in terms of its ruthlessness, the only parallel he can think of for the tigers is the Nazi movement of the 1930s in Europe. Now, this is a man who has written a huge book on other guerrilla movements, so he could have compared them with X, Y, or Z. This is also the editor of the Penguin Reader's Guide to Fascism, so he knows what he's talking about. We fought not merely a separatist movement, not merely a terrorist movement, however powerful. We fought against and prevailed over a fascist movement, and we are now being punished for having defeated fascism. When that was a moral test that our society passed, we are being asked to assume that we have committed war crimes, crimes against humanity, system-wide crimes, which therefore cannot be tried through the existing laws of Sri Lanka which prevailed when the war was on, which cannot be prosecuted through the existing Attorney General's office, which cannot be prosecuted to the, through the existing system of courts, so that we have to set up special courts you know where the idea of special courts come from, this is it's Nuremberg. So we, having defeated after 30 years, a fascist enemy, not just a terrorist or separatist enemy, we have to try ourselves, our armed forces, which liberated us, defeated fascism, reunified the country, we have to fall on our sword. And there are those who have agreed to this. This is why I feel that if we have any decency, let alone patriotism, any decency in us as individuals and as a society, any gratitude, any logic, any rationality in us, we have to resist and oppose the attempt to implement this immoral Geneva Resolution. And that is the test by which future generations will judge us. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.